Hi, I'm Ryan Avent. I'm an economics blogger with uh, The Economist, and I uh, blog at my personal site at ryanavent.com. Hi, I'm Jim Manzi. I write and blog at National Review as well as The American Scene, and in my day job, I'm the CEO of an artificial intelligence software company. And we're here today to talk about uh, some recent work uh, that Jim has put together uh, at uh, National Review and in the American scene, but most recently at, at, at Cato, uh, on the subject of, of global warming. And, and Jim, can you just, I guess, give us sort of a, a quick summary of, uh, of what your position is uh, on, on warming? Sure. I guess I originally started writing about this uh, in reaction to a number of proposals that uh, have been put forward and widely discussed. And uh, in a high-level summary form, uh, I'd, I'd say the following, um, that it's pretty clear that CO2 molecules absorb and redirect uh, shortwave radiation and not long-wave radiation. And therefore, all else equal, the more you put in the atmosphere, the hotter it's going to get. Um, how much hotter is a very complicated subject that's been the object of pretty intense uh, scientific scrutiny uh, for the last several decades. Uh, the right. United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, is generally recognized as <clears throat> the kind of premier body that tries to collate known knowledge against technical questions like that and create a, uh, at least a reference case for uh, best available estimates. And at a high level, uh, what they've said is the following, that between now and the end of the century, under reasonable assumptions for world population and economic growth, we should expect just about three degrees, in, again, uh, in, in, a, in a sort of uh, reference case scenario, we should expect about three degrees centigrade of warming versus today by about 2100. Um, a second thing they've said is that <clears throat> if we achieve about four degrees of warming versus today, we should expect economic costs on the order of one to five percent of global GDP. Um, therefore, if you figure we're at something like three degrees of warming by 2100, by the time we get to four degrees warming, no one really knows when that would be, but in that scenario, let's say 2120, 2130, 2140, something like that, we should be at the point where we're generating about, again, one to five percent of global economic output and damages. And I think that this is really the central problem for the advocates of uh, aggressive programs to immediately abate carbon emissions, which is that while money is not the measure of everything that matters in life, <coughs> uh, losing on the order of 3% of economic output, something over 100 years from now, doesn't comport well with a lot of the rhetoric of you know, Manhattan being an underwater theme park uh, and so on. Now, I, I think that, that, that you make a good point uh, about, uh, you know, about the, the sort of gap between perceptions uh, of Earth hanging in the balance and things like that, and, uh, and sort of what the actual numbers say about, you know, the potential economic costs to warming. I mean, it's not, um, particularly not in, in the next few decades, we're not looking at, at total collapse. At the same time, I think, I, I think one source of criticism uh, that people have made of your, of your, your plans, from the left at least, uh, is that that doesn't mean that we shouldn't take action, and that doesn't mean that there aren't still considerable risks that need to be uh, addressed. Uh, and I think that's where I mean, now there are debates with you about about your outlook for the, for temperature uh, and things like that. And Joe Rahm, I know, has, has been a big critic of, of yours on that point. But but then you also go on and say that that really we don't need to to do things that a lot of economists and and political leaders would suggest, like a carbon tax or a cap and trade system. Um, and I think that's that's one source of conflict over what you said. But but let me ask you something else real quick before while we're still talking about the outlook. Um, looking at, at sort of uh, the models uh, that Nordhaus has used, which I know you, you talk about um, about his work, and he's sort of the expert on these models that, that discuss the interaction between economics and, uh, and climate. He says, uh, and let me see if I can quote this, that um, he uses this, the, the DICE model, right? Uh, and, and he projects that like you say, there's a potential increase of three degrees by 2100, uh, and, and potentially up to five degrees by 2200. Um, but says that we can expect three percent of GDP to be the economic cost by 2100, and then potentially up to eight percent by 2200. Now, obviously, when you're projecting out 150, 200 years, there's going to be you know, 
a lot of uncertainty on either side. But do you want to talk about your view of, of the models and and whether it's reasonable to say, okay, look, this is what we're talking about, and we can have confidence in this specific number? Gotcha. Well, let's see. Um, there are a number of uh, points you raised, all of them I think good. Um, one is kind of where you, you started, I think, is 3% of global economic output is a gigantic amount of money. And right. so uh, <clears throat> it normally would be considered an amount of money we want to go after, which is to say we would uh, put in place programs that are, cost a lot of money if we, we could go get uh, 3% of global GDP, which, which I think is a great point and we ought to come back to uh, for sure. Okay. Second, um, the second point I think is you, you raised um, uh, a reference to the fact that uh, in a lot of the back and forth in the Cato and Bound discussion, uh, one of the points that uh, Joseph Rahm raised was the idea that the factual assertion I just made, which is that the IPC's estimates under reasonable scenarios uh, for uh, population and economic growth and therefore emissions should be about three degrees of warming by 2100. Um, I don't want to necessarily try and go into that in, in, in a huge amount of detail here, although I'm happy to. I just kind of refer viewers to where the term for podcast watchers is uh, to that discussion. I, I think that whenever, you know, you, you watch one of these discussions, everyone's sort of got an axe to grind, and I, I, wouldn't necessarily, I wouldn't want to leave the impression that, gee, you know, one guy says this, one guy says that, who knows? I think that specific narrow question, what does the IPCC say uh, about this subject is... is Determinable by fact, and uh, I, I think that it's, it's the FCC is not this is, is not infallible, uh, but I, I'm pretty comfortable about what I'm asserting about what they say. Um, the, the next point <coughs> that you raised uh, touches on a couple things, which is as we think about economic models uh, that integrate environmental and economic understanding and make projections forward, how much confidence can we have in a specific point estimate? and what is the role of uncertainty. And I think uh, we cannot have great confidence in any point estimate. That the, the fundamental fact to think about, I think, that underpins everything when we look forward to try and assess <coughs> the rationality of various programs related to global warming is uncertainty. And it's what a guy named Martin Weitzman, who's a professor at Harvard, is a, a very smart guy who's real deep mm -hmm. in the subject, has called cascading uncertainty. So if you think about it, in order to evaluate a, a proposed policy to address global warming risk, you have to make four sequential analyses. The first is you have to have an emission scenario. So to simplify a little bit, you have to have a viewpoint that says, I'm going to admit under this scenario for how the world's going to grow or not grow over time, this amount of carbon in 2008, this amount in 2009, this amount in 2010, out to you know, 2200 or whatever. Second, you need a machine to convert that emission scenario to an estimated <coughs> temperature change, which is a simplification of its objective climate change. Third, you need to have a method for converting that estimated change in temperature or more broadly climate to costs, economic and non-economic, that we expect would occur under that scenario. And then fourth, you need to have some way to say, how do I evaluate the utility to me of alternative streams of costs and benefits under alternative policies? And I think that <clears throat> there is uncertainty, there is large uncertainty in every single one of those steps. Um, and I've started by talking about the reference case uh, when I sort of gave under reasonable assumptions and so forth caveats as I described the reference case, because I think it's important to understand the central tendency of the distribution. Uh, but there are uh, wide distributions of risk, in my view, at every step of that calculation. And it's really that risk that I think informs the kind of policies we want to put in place, uh, which is to say, you, what you're worried about is, in, in slang terms, the tail of the distribution. You're worried about trying to ensure yourself against unlikely but severe outcomes. Right, and you know, and I think, I think that's something that um, that you sort of that you you look at and you say, it seems like you said, um, you know, we have this probability distribution that says here are likely outcomes. Uh, and and some critics when they're saying, you know, but what about what if it's worse or something like that? Then you know you're that's like saying that we're assuming that our probability distribution itself is wrong, which is kind of a problematic way of looking at things. But I, I mean, I do think that a lot of these guys that are running these models, you know, will will say Nordhaus says, you know, we know our probability distribution is wrong. Like we know 
uh, you know, that, that it's, it's not close and there's other things out there and that we're not even taking into consideration, you know, the potential for certain low probability catastrophic events. So, you know, given that, you know, is it not reasonable to, I mean, what's the reasonable level of, uh, you know, a, a sort of insurance policy that we need to pay for? Or, or should we come back to that later? What do you think? Uh, well, I think that that is a, kind of a central question, and I will probably come at it now and come at it later in, in a couple different ways. I, I guess the, the place I'd start with that is, um, the, if you think about the first step of this, which is estimating how the world economy is going to evolve over the next 100 plus years, I think the IPCC is pretty sensible. And they actually don't say, look, this is what we think is going to happen. They just lay out a set of scenarios um, and they have about 35 of those scenarios, and six of them they call marker scenarios, which are meant to represent broadly uh, a spectrum of plausible um, scenarios by which the world could develop. And you always need to be careful to say, is, is the answer I'm getting to reasonably robust against these different scenarios? Then when you get to, okay, given an amount of, of carbon emission I have, or more broadly GHG emission, um, what is the amount of warming I can expect as a function of that um, you know, uh, uh, emission or emissions path. And <clears throat> this has been, when you talk about global climate models, this has been the subject of, you know, enormous research. Um, that distribution from the time of the Charney Commission in 1979 through every IPCC report uh, over the last 20 or so years has always centered about a, what's called a climate sensitivity of about 3 degrees centigrade, and it's at a range of kind of 1.5 degrees to 4.5 degrees centigrade. Um, so while it's difficult to validate those models, that has at least been a very stable uh, distribution of uh, estimates for the kind of response you'll get in terms of warming from emissions. What Nordenhaus and others uh, who are doing integrated environmental economics modeling are really addressing are the third and fourth steps of this process, uh, which is to say, you know, how do I convert that to cost, and then how do I discount that back and look at alternative policies? And um, I think that... <coughs> Uh, you, you have to start with the observation that they're not foolish enough to just say, well, here's what we kind of expect to happen uh, with warming. Here's what we expect costs to be. They actually, they actually go through the process of saying, well, you know, what's the chance that it's not going to be three degrees warming? It's going to be four degrees. It's going to be five degrees. It's going to be six degrees, and so on. And if you read the, which I know you have, when one reads the IPCC reports, they literally show, here's the probability distributions that we have estimated against the steps of this, uh, the key mm. core steps of this process. And so, unless one wants to say, I'm challenging the work that they've done in building these probability distributions, when you work through the economics modeling to say, <clears throat> uh, to move beyond what I was talking about, which is just the raw numbers of, look, here's what we think it's going to cost, uh, here's what we think the warming's going to be, but all the way to, how do I evaluate different policies, the guys like Nordhaus and the EPA and others who have done that modeling have used those probability distributions to create expected values. So they've said, we think there are these odds of warming being this much worse, these odds of warming being that much less bad than expected. And so that's what I mean when I say, when you work through that math, you come back to numbers that make it very difficult to justify on an expected value basis, not just on an expected basis, the costs, at least as, as I see them, <coughs> of uh, implementing aggressive abatement. So what you're really saying is there is some risk that that probability distribution or those distributions themselves are wrong. That's not a crazy risk in my view. I mean, this is the essence of Weitzman's argument, who's widely cited often in this debate, that we don't know with certainty that those probability distributions are correct. That's always true for any probability distribution, but in this case, it's sensible to say that's a real work. Um, I think there's there's real substance to that to that part of the argument. However, you then are in a situation of saying I can't quantify it. Um, I don't have an analytical way of s scoping this risk because it's uncertainty rather than risk. And you then have to make a lot of judgments about what do I want to invest today or what do I want to give up today to help protect myself against that non-quantifiable risk. Right. Well, and, and and I know, and that's a dangerous you know path to go down. Um, and you don't want to just say we're going to you know spend any amount of money to, uh, to to forestall these you know potentially catastrophic uh, events that we don't we you know that we have no way of analyzing how likely they are. 
the same time, I mean, I think it's probably reasonable to say, given that, you know, these risks are out there, it should at least bias our actions, you know, uh, toward perhaps being um, more aggressive than the, the optimal case, you know, and that doesn't, that doesn't have to mean that, that we adopt, uh, you know, something along the lines of, of the Stern Report's recommendations. Um, but it might say that, you know, that the Nordhaus recommendations, you know, you know, if we look at, at the conditions under which we're able to sort of do this, this carbon policy regime and it doesn't make sense, we still might want to go ahead with it because we know there's this risk out here. You, you know what I mean? I do. And uh, I certainly advocate a number of policies that if we knew for a fact warming and its costs would be at exactly the midpoint of our expected distribution warming costs, could not be justified. In other words, they are purely justified in order to help us try and quote unquote insure ourselves in the event that we are in a very unlikely but uh, bad situation uh, due to global warming. And I think that one of the ways, sorry, I don't want to cut you off. So I was just going to ask you to repeat that. I didn't, I didn't get it. Sorry, uh, I, I was agreeing with you in concept and, okay. uh, and saying that, uh, in fact, uh, in the things I've written, I've advocated specific policies that if we knew for a fact a priori today that warming and the cost of warming would occur exactly at the midpoint of our distributions for expectations of warming and cost of warming would not be justified. The only logical justification for some policies I've put forward uh, is the fact that there are these difficult to quantify but severe risks that if they occurred would be bad and we bad enough that we can be justified spending some money on them today. All right. Um, well, you mentioned a second ago that that in looking at sort of these probability distributions of, of potential effects and potential costs, that the aggressive abatement strategies aren't justified. And I think that's one thing that I think um, is troubling to me about about some of the arguments you make is that it seems like you you know you you are following along, say, with what Nordhaus would say, and then in seeking to sort of argue against something like a carbon tax, you begin bringing up these aggressive abatement strategies along the lines of what Al Gore or the Stern uh, Review uh, have suggested, which is involves a lot more abatement uh, much more rapidly, um, you know, and sort of a, a price of carbon that would be, you know, uh, 10 or more times higher than, than what Nordhaus has recommended. And, I, you know, I think what model or what, what policy choice you're suggesting is, you know, has a lot to do with whether or not it's going to be worthwhile. So, it, you know, if we agree that, that we're not going to do what, what Stern thinks is correct, right, and have a $200 to $400 uh, price on carbon, per ton of carbon, you know, I think that, that changes sort of the outlook. But I don't want to get into the weeds here too much with, with these uh, calculations. But do you, do you know what I'm saying? I, I know exactly what you're saying. So... What I'd say is, is the following, that uh, moving from using the IPCC data as kind of a starting point to now what you're referencing, which is Nordhaus and others, but we can focus on Nordhaus because he's, I think, such a clear writer, um, yeah. his analysis of that and other related data. Um, Nordhaus is a, he's a, he's a professor of economics at Yale who leads a modeling group that's spent a long time uh, trying to evaluate this question of what is the present value of alternative policies to address global warming risk? And I think it's generally recognized as you know, one of the leaders of this question. And he has done analysis using basically the data I've talked about that has led him to conclude and advocate a carbon tax, to your point, at a, uh, at a price per ton of carbon, which is substantially less than yet more uh, aggressive advocates like Stern, Al Gore, and others. Right. And my uh, basic criticism of Nordhaus's analysis is that it is theoretically accurate, but it makes assumptions that, in my view, are not realistic about the world. In other words, it assumes that we are able to implement, in order to offset some global warming costs, um, a harmonized, globally enforced uh, tax on carbon. And if you think about the numbers, that, just as a reference, I guess, that Nordhaus uses, under the set of assumptions he applies, the total present value of cost of global warming, I'm giving this from memory, so I might be slightly off, to the world are about $23 trillion of present value of warming costs. He says, by his analysis, that we should just let about $17 trillion of that occur. 
or something like 70, 75 percent of it occurs. Right. It's more expensive, exactly, to get out from under it than to fix it. For the remaining like five and a half to six uh, trillion dollars of damages, he advocates a carbon tax. To your point, at the, on the order of thirty or forty dollars uh, per ton of carbon, that would eliminate say five and a half trillion uh, dollars of damages. But on the other hand, it would cost, by his modeling, something like two or three trillion. So the net benefit here is about $3 trillion. And to put that in, in context, if you think about that as a fraction of present value of global economic output over the next couple hundred years, uh, it's something like 0.17% of total uh, economic output for the world. And so I think the, the practical problem when we go from the world of modeling to the world of you know, geostrategic competition and domestic politics is, Think of what it would mean to actually implement a, a policy like that. You know, what do you think when you have to get the Chinese Politburo and Vladimir Putin or John Dingell, USF and all lobby, and I don't mean to be dumb, you know, foreign nations, you know, they're all going to take a cut of that. They're going to demand lots of side deals to go along. You're going to create, in my view, you are likely to create tons of economic drag by doing that, likely to grossly offset the theoretical benefit we'll create. Now, that's a practical argument. One, can, one can't prove that analytically. But that's why I think when you really start to get serious about the numbers, it gets very hard to justify a program which if you accepted the premise that the world's going to be destroyed, you'd of course do. But I just, I, I have not seen analysis which can seem to justify it. Well, I think, I mean, I think, I have a, I think a couple things about that. Um, I think it's interesting, for one, and, and I know that you've got Nordhaus and, and Schellenberger to, uh, to, act, to write a, a reaction essay at, uh, at Cato Unbound. Um, and you know, these are smart guys. And having, I mean, having read your um, your excellent essay, they, you know, Nordhaus still sort of maintains that. I mean, you you know, the market with someone who's serious about climate change is their willing willingness to to say that we need a carbon tax. Um, now that said, he does say we optimally we need this global uh, harmonized uh, carbon tax. And he says that look, if you're only going to get 50 to 75 percent, uh, uh, you know, of the world's uh, emissions involved in the system that's going to have such and such costs. Um, I think there, you know, there are a few things that need to be mentioned in, that, in there. And one is that um, obviously the U.S. Is, alone is a huge emitter of carbon. Uh, we, you know, we emit something like 22 percent uh, of the world's carbon. Um, and so, you know, even it, it, you know, even if it was just us making these measures, you know, that still could be potentially a significant. Uh, reduction in emissions, and it might, and, you know, it might buy time to, to for us to sit down at the negotiating table with people uh, like Medvedev and uh, and China and all these other participants. But I also think that you don't want to. I mean, the actual game that we're playing in terms of negotiations doesn't necessarily have to be a huge one. I mean, if you talk about sitting down at a table with, with the U.S., uh, uh, with Europe, and with China, I mean, you have three players there, and that's um, that's well over. Or not well. That's about 55 percent of global emissions. Uh, and if you add just a few other players, if you add Korea, Japan, Canada, and Russia, then you've pretty much got you know three quarters of world emissions. So it's not like we have to get the entire uh, you know the entire world uh, sitting down at the table in an agreement. That said, I mean obviously there's going to be deals that need to be struck, uh, and we sort of saw this even just in the United States Congress when Lieberman Warner uh, was there. It's you know some of the things that had to be thrown into the mix in order to get something under consideration. And that, you know, potentially could add some, some drags uh, to the economy. But I thought it was interesting in, in something you wrote recently that, you know, you compared the sort of the potential for these negotiations to the, the recent failure of the Doha round of, of world trade talks. And I thought that was interesting because, um, you know, if, if you look at sort of the the, the success that, that, that GATT and then the WTO have had in reducing... Uh, trade barriers over the last 50 to 60 years. You know, if we could get that kind of success uh, with emissions, you know, I think we'd all take it. You know, and the WTO is, is, you know, a really impressive international organization in the sense that it gets, uh, you know, countries like America and China to sit down and, 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 and give things up. Uh, and, and the important thing about it is that, it, it, you know, countries like having that thing there because, you know, it gives them something to go back to, to the their, you know, their domestic constituents and say, look, you know, our hands are tied, like we're a member of WTO, like we have to abide by this. It's a commitment mechanism for them. And so, you know, I don't think it's outlandish to think that we might get, you know, given that, you know, China obviously has an interest in, 
and, and you know, in safeguarding the world, considering that it probably thinks of itself as, as you know, the, the power of the 21st, 22nd centuries. You know, there there are interests in every country in in arriving at an agreement. I don't think it's outlandish to think that that could be done. Well, let's see. I I, I, I wouldn't call it outlandish. Um, I think that the, the point I was trying to make in, co- in comparing uh, this hypothetical process to GATT was, you know, the point of GATT is to, the intention is to, on average at least, make the people who are signing in and currently live in the world richer. And the net effect for lots of people in the world, at least in the short term, of the kind of carbon tax, global carbon tax agreement we'll be discussing here would be to make them sacrifice in order to generate uh, project at least benefits in the future. And I think that um, the behavior of you know, China, India, Brazil, and, and frankly the United States uh, to date indicates where they stand on this trade-off. And I, I gotta say, if, if I were in China, for sure, um, there wouldn't be a lot of question in my mind if I believed that I was gonna be sacrificing economic growth today, um, given how poor I am now and how rapidly richer I'm getting, uh, I think I'd be very unlikely to want to give up economic growth at a significant level, at least today, in return for future benefits. And I think well, even if you got to agreement, you would then have to enforce an agreement for you know decades, probably more than 100 years, right? Uh, which will run directly contrary to the material interests of people alive on the planet. So how likely do you think a rural Chinese, and I'm not trying to pick on China, uh, a rural Chinese official will be to really enforce these rules on a, a coal plant nearby um, uh, rather than kind of let them slide. So I, I think, I wouldn't call it outlandish, but I, I'll, I'll kind of believe it when I see it uh, in terms well, of trading. Well, I mean, I, I think there are enforcement questions also with trade. And, you know, one of the things, I mean, the, the WTO is it has, uh, you know, uh, institutional means to sort of address some of these these things. And, you know, I mean, uh, we constantly hear that happening, right? The, the United States and China filing grievances against each other, and these are heard and sort of resolved. So I think, you know, there are, are ways to, to, you know, to develop institutional structures that might facilitate all this. But you said that, that, you know, when you're, at least theoretically, when you're reducing trade barriers, you're making the country better off. Whereas with um, reducing emissions, you know, there, there's going to be a cost there. And I think, I think we have a tendency to overstate those costs. Um, and, and let me give you an example. If we talk about the the $30 or $40 uh, per ton carbon tax that, say, Nordhaus says would be optimal. You know, we're talking about something along the lines of, of a 9 or $0.10 cent increase in the price of gasoline, right? Uh, or, you know, or a 10% uh, increase in the retail price of electricity. You know, and, and these things are, you know, he says that a carbon tax in the United States of $30 per ton would raise $50 billion. And so that works out to about something like $160, $170 per person per year, you know. And uh, so I, if you had this spectacle during the Lieberman-Warner debates of President Bush, you know, warning people that if, if this bill passed, that it might raise their gas prices by 40 cents by the year 2030 or 2040. And, you know, you, these, are not, these are not scary costs, um, given, you know, given the fact that, that you know, we're, we have these, these potential threats to the economy. And I, one other thing, I, point I'd like to make is that um, you know Nordhaus has said that we shouldn't get too caught up in, in looking at these costs as strictly costs with no offsetting benefits. Uh, you know, if you look at um, the effects of, of high gas prices this year, you know, obviously it's, it's caused a lot of pain for people. On the other hand, the reduced driving has has reduced congestion costs. Uh, it's it's reduced uh, highway fatalities. Um, you know, there's even reports out there that say it's reduced obesity. Uh, and, and so, you know, certainly if we look at, at some of these measures in turn that are going to increase efficiency and things like that, it's going to insulate us from f- future swings in the price of fossil fuels. Uh, you know, there's, and there's going to be other benefits that sort of come along with it. So it's not like these are straight costs, um, which isn't to say that, you know, th- there won't be cost. Um, but I think that it's wrong to think that there, you know, this is a, you know, a, a lose-lose situation that, uh, you know, in, in adopting these measures, or that it's just going to be a mind-bogglingly costly thing that's going to rearrange the economy. When, you, when you're talking about seven to ten cents uh, per gallon, I, I think it's going to be hard to get people to accept that. Right. Well, I, I think uh, there's a lot to that. I think that um, 
first of all, there is a history, certainly in narrow, more narrowly targeted environmental regulations, of industry claiming it's going to cost $10 trillion, dollars, and it turns out to be pretty cheap to put in place. So I think we always have to be uh, conscious of it might end up costing less than we think it does. I, I think, though, that using the numbers, which I agree with, you know, $30 a ton uh, of carbon translates to, like, $0.09 cents a gallon for gasoline or uh, something like less than a 10% per kilowatt hour increase in the price of your electricity bill. But I think that when you make that argument, uh, when one makes that argument, you're kind of between a rock and a hard place. Because if you think about it, the, the price of a gallon of gas in the U.S. at least has gone from uh, up about 140% over the last several years. You know, it's gone from about $1.50, it's like $2.60 now. And, um, uh, probably about $3.60. And <clears throat> there's already 40 to 50 cents a gallon of tax per gas in the United States. In Western Europe, it's several dollars a gallon. Yeah. And, you know, if you think about, well, if... if emissions and resulting warming and resulting costs occur about as expected by current science and, and modeling, then we, we would not want to put in place uh, expensive measures. So really what we're worried about is the tail, right? And you say, okay, if for the next 40 years we have a 10 cent per gallon, to your point, under the quote-unquote optimal policy graph, ramping up to maybe 40 or 50 cents a gallon by like the year 2050, you know, how much reduction in emissions is that going to create? Um, it's going to be relatively small in the scenario in which we are, we are going to be uh, getting to extreme amounts of damage, much worse than we expect. And so what I advocate is basically saying, look, we're worried about a low incidence, high severity risk. So we should work our way backwards from, assume that it's true, assume that we are in a world where we don't quite know it yet, but actually we are near a tipping point, it's warming damage is going to be dramatic. How much are we going to be helped by, on one hand, saying, let's have gasoline, you know, to put it in rough terms, be 30 cents a gallon more, as opposed to saying, look, if we end up in that bad situation, what we would have wanted to have done was all the long lead time engineering work and research work to have technical options available to us to deal with that, deal with that problem. Because if, on one hand, the price of gas is from 20 cents a gallon, that's not really going to have that much effect. Um, if you really believe that the case where you want to have a gas tax at all or a carbon tax at all were true, you'd actually want to have a gigantic increase today in, um, in, in, in uh, price of carbon, which I don't think is justified. Well, I think, I mean, I think that, you know, it, it's convenient to use, you know, the, the price of gas or, or, you know, the expected total bill um, to sort of illustrate, you know, where the costs or what the costs are going to look like for the average consumer. I don't think it's right to say that, look, because we're talking about increases in the price of gas, that's where we're going to expect to see the reductions. Uh, uh, that's a great point. Right, a seven cents increase in, in, in the price of gas isn't going to, uh, isn't going to really drop emissions all that much. That's a very fair point. I, mean, I think, you know, cement manufacturing is going to be affected a lot more quickly than driving in a car. I, I agree with that. I mean, yeah, I mean, the point I'd like to make is that if you're in a, in a grocery store in the produce aisle and you look at two heads of lettuce... Right, and uh, you know, one could have been grown uh, in a greenhouse and, and might have ten times the emissions content uh, of a similar one that costs roughly the same. And without a carbon tax, you you neither have the information available to make a distinction between you know the the, the very dirty head of lettuce and the, and the clean head of lettuce. And you also don't have the incentive. You know, and when you price carbon. You, what you do is you, you make a lot of those tiny decisions easier, and, and you, you make it possible to pick all the low-hanging fruit. And I think the other thing is, is that it, it prevents us from making really bad decisions, uh, you know, out of good intentions. Uh, and, and you look at something like ethanol, um, which would, you know, it's already a boondoggle and a bad idea, but if we had a carbon tax, it would quickly be apparent how big a boondoggle and how bad an idea it was. Yeah. Uh, and, you, and you have things like, like uh, locavores, right, who... who are looking at the, the food mile uh, that are associated with a given piece of food. Uh, and this actually, you know, if, like, again, if this food that's grown locally is grown in greenhouses, it could actually be quite, um, you know, unhelpful uh, to be a part of this movement. And, and, and that's where things like a carbon tax are absolutely necessary because they help people make right decisions when it's easy to do so. Uh, and they prevent them from making very bad decisions, again, when it's easy to do so. And it's sort of like... I mean, I think that's one thing, one reason why Nordhaus says this is 
mean, this is the one policy we can't afford to do without. Right. Well, I mean, I think that, uh, uh, first of all, you're not going to get me to, to defend, you know, the ethanol program, which I, I think there's, you know, there's plenty of innovation to know right now is a complete boom uh, That's a subject, I guess, for another time. Uh, but, you know, I think I agree with you that if you, um, if you add a carbon tax, you will change decisions on the margin. Uh, I think, however, that it's pretty hard to, to make the case that there are enough of those easy decisions that are going to drive down enough consumption that you're actually going to achieve any of the, anything approaching the goals that folks are talking about. I mean, if you think about it on a common sense level, the targets that are being talked about are like an 80% reduction uh, over the next several decades versus the amount of emissions we would otherwise have done. And the problem is about 85% of the energy in the economy is generated through fossil fuels. And so it's going to be incredibly expensive to squeeze more than marginal amounts of that energy out. In a sufficiently bad emergency, it would be worth doing. Uh, but I think it's very hard to make the case that you can find enough of those buying lettuce and in the supermarket examples uh, well, to drive enough energy out of the economy if that work. Certainly, I'm not sure I agree with that, though, because you know, it's not that we are necessarily reducing consumption. It's that we would be shifting consumption. You know, and I mean, it's unclear to us at this point how many goods how many decisions out there are being made where people are roughly indifferent between, you know, one or another. Uh, and so, you know, if you get people making a decision that has some information involved about carbon content and the market goes off optimizing in that direction rather than in another direction when there's no information about carbon involved, I mean, over over a period of years, which is, which is what we're talking about, you know, that, that ends up becoming quite a, a, a big deal. Uh, and I think, you know, it's it's... I think it's wrong to think, like like Stern and like Al Gore say, that what we need to do now is, is have the, this huge rush to, to to drop consumption. What we need to do is is shift consumption decisions on the on the margin away from uh, away from carbon, so that we can let the market work and sort of optimize in you know in millions of different ways and all over all these different transactions to sort of to make it work. And if you don't have that carbon information in the price, then there's no hope of doing that. I mean, there's, there's, you lose that entire uh, that entire method for for addressing this problem, and you're stuck with something else. You're stuck with the big discoveries, or you know, the carbon eating trees, or something like that. Yeah, I think that uh, I think that the the point that uh, Ted Nordhaus did, to be clear, is not William Nordhaus. William Nordhaus is the Yale economist, and confusingly, Ted Nordhaus is one of the two people who responded uh, to, to my essay. Uh, Ted Nordhaus oh, and sorry. Michael Schellenberger. Um, yeah, yeah, I know you know that. I just a lot of viewers might not. Um, those, uh, what th- these guys have written a book, and I think focused a lot of attention on a point that I fully agree with, which is that um, the way in which you get less emissions without, while still adding economic growth, uh, is new technology. That really, ultimately, you know, hair shirts will not be enough here. You know, people, uh, and I'm not trying to minimize it. But people biking to work instead of driving to work, people putting in more efficient light bulbs, etc. When you add up all those opportunities, they're just not sufficient, especially when you think about it on a global basis, um, uh, to generate the energy that's going to be required for economic growth uh, without getting uh, without having emissions going to rise radically. And so, I think that any way you slice it, um, technology is required to accomplish the things you're talking about. And I think the the problem with using a price signal. Uh, to force that is that uh, fossil fuels are, without considering all these externalities we're describing, are so profitable versus alternatives. And now one can make the argument the, the externalities are so severe that we need to basically force people to make, not force, you know, drive people to make different decisions with pricing. The problem is you have to get that price signal so high before you force enough change that you can't do it uh, practically. And I think the best evidence for that is you know, the price of oil in 1980 on an inflation-adjusted basis is about what it is today. It's about $110 a barrel or so in current dollars. And, you know, we had a 10-year huge increase in the price of fossil fuels, and yet we, the economy decarbonized a little bit faster than it would have otherwise, but not anything approaching what's needed to accomplish the kind of scenarios that are being described as the target of why we would price carbon. Um, I, I think it's going to be very hard to make that empirical argument that you can accomplish that goal with price carbon. Well, I'm not, I'm still, I'm not sure that I, I mean, I think that the point of sort of Nordhaus, William Nordhaus analysis is that, I mean, this is, this is the entire argument is that it's, 
you have this social externality and you get it priced right uh, and you adopt the correct you know Pigovian tax then um, you know and you ramp it up appropriately uh, that you do get that result and you get the result because you're making millions of small decisions over time um, but li I mean I think that that you're absolutely correct that um, that technology is going to be key and I think you know, my position is that in addition to the carbon tax, we need to to address uh, research funding because, you know, in the meantime, you just don't want to be in the meantime, you want to be taking the minimum step necessary uh, to solve the problem. Um, and I guess if we have a fundamental disagreement about the necessity there, um, but you know, I, I think that that the you know, as you say. Um, with regards to the IPCC climate scientists, when, when they're sort of confronted with uh, the population dis or the uh, probability distribution issue, like these guys aren't stupid. It's not like it hasn't occurred to them. And yet, you do see, you know, most people in, in economics uh, and politics talking about the need for a carbon tax. And I think there's a very good reason for that. Is that it? That's the easiest way to pick the low the low hanging fruit and to prevent us from making big decisions that, like you know, like ethanol, that are going to come back and bite us. Yeah, I hear you. I think that, you know, when we move from the world of this kind of discussion to politicians, uh, I think saying politicians are in favor of raising a tax uh, is not necessarily motivated by the same concern for humanity you know, that you have, and is a lot more motivated by they want to raise taxes. Uh, but I agree with you. We, we've kind of, I think, bounded the question to the degree it can be bounded uh, by analysis. I mean, m my conclusion looking at that data is that if the tax is the theoretical tax, or equivalently, as, as you said, and I agree, cap and trade, designed correctly, the, if the amount of tax is the amount that can be justified through uh, rigorous analysis, the benefit it creates is small enough that the, the political cost of creating the tax will outweigh the theoretical benefit. If it's big enough so that those theoretical benefits are large enough to outweigh those political costs, the, you have so outsized the price that you're going to destroy value that way. I just don't see where you find the practical solution of a tax which is at a level that is both justified theoretically and can overcome the cost of political drag. But but that embeds all kinds of political value judgments. It's not purely analytical. Uh, well, I, I, I mean, we can agree to disagree on the yeah. effectiveness of, of, you know, $30 per ton carbon tax. Um, but I will also agree that, um, you know, the government can obviously make some, some great investments in technology that are going to facilitate this process. I mean, the, the easier it is to substitute away from dirty technologies, and that doesn't just mean power generation. It means, you know, automobiles, light bulbs, all this stuff. Um, you know, the, the, the less costly any sort of carbon pricing policy is going to be. So that's obviously something that we might want to look at, especially considering uh, the sort of knock-on effects you get from, from research and development in general. And that's obviously something that's, that's you know, good for the economy. Um, so, you know, stipulating that, that disagreement about pricing, I mean, do you want to talk about sort of your thoughts on the technology issue? Or? Sure. I mean, the, the general philosophy I've, uh, I've put forward around that question is that the, the, cor the correctly bounded public purpose that the government ought to be serving as opposed to markets should be <clears throat> trying to stimulate the development and fund, actually, the development of technology that serves to either help us predict or blunt the uh, uh, overall effects of warming and the damages it creates, um, and that serves that social purpose as opposed to the government trying to execute what is really just industrial policy by another name and uh, make bets about where in the economy we should be uh, accelerating decarbonization. So, for example, better climate models, uh, research into how you change uh, the reflectiveness of the, of the uh, atmosphere or surface of the Europe, et cetera, are, are all to me legitimate uh, uses of public money and I think advisable as an insurance policy against low probability and high severity outcomes. I think that the government doing things like, as John McCain has proposed, uh, offering a prize for someone who can develop a better performing auto battery is uh, not a good idea because the economic returns to anyone who can build that are already so high uh, that it's right. not a smart use of money. And I think the history of the government trying to do things in the last energy crisis, like the, the large-scale Boeing wind, wind turbine uh, program or the Exxon Shell, Shell program, is that political allocation of resources uh, tends to be pretty ineffective. 
Um, and so I, I've advocated spending on the former category, not the latter category, which in crude terms, I think, ought to be single-digit billions uh, per year by the U.S. federal government. Now, I, I, the, uh, in the response by Norton Allison Schellenberger at Cato Unbound, I think they made an interesting point um, that we have a lot of technologies that are currently available that could make uh, potentially a huge uh, dent in, in emissions, uh, and the problem is not necessarily discovery; it's the uh, it's the deployment. So, you know, we have effective windmill technology now, and what's needed is deployment of these windmills, and you know, uh, the construction of a better grid that will allow us to to move massive amounts of power efficiently from you know the plains to to the east coast and things like that. Uh, you know, we can. We can, we can electrify uh, the automobile fleet and build a lot of transit, provided that we're willing to, you know, to make these expenses and things like that. That doesn't seem to be the angle that, that uh, you seem to be taking, that, that we, you don't think we need to be spending money on deployment so much as sort of on the workshops where people, I guess, well, tell me where you want to, <laughs> where you think we ought to be spending the money. You don't think it's on deployment, I guess, is, is, is what I'm saying. Yeah, at the, we're obviously speaking a pretty high level of abstraction here. Um, <clears throat> to the point it's almost, you know, cartoonish. And, you know, I, I say markets, 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 and, you know, there's an alternative that says, you know, government, government, government. And, you know, to put it mildly, the, the it is not a completely understood relationship, in my view, over the history of the country, how investments in infrastructure and moon landing type programs relate to subsequent economic growth. So, you know, I, I've laid out a set of philosophical principles. Um, I can certainly see an argument for um, there's a specific piece of infrastructure spending that is analogous to highway uh, highway building or to railroad rights of way in the 19th century, such that you could argue there's a legitimate government purpose. Um, I think that in general we should be leaning away from that, but you know we can consider that on a case by case basis. And I think that's, in my view, a lot of the virtue of the Schellenberger Norhaus approach, which is that it lends itself to case-by-case consideration, and trial and error learning. I mean, we, we, we don't have to make, in the context of the size of the U.S. economy, huge economy-wide bets to try some of these things and to the extent we're seeing success uh, to move forward. So I wouldn't want to be ideological about it, but in general, I think uh, the less all else equal we have the government in the business of deciding, you know, this technology uh, is one we're going to put a lot of tax money behind instead of that technology because they think this one's going to win in, over time in the marketplace. I think it's something we to avoid in cases where we don't see an absolute necessity for it. Right. Well, I, you know, I would agree that, that picking winners is not, not something that, you know, we really would like to get in the business of doing. But, you know, to go back to the carbon policy thing, and I know that, um, you know, you're not going to get a ton of, of innovation going with a, you know, with a $30 per, per ton of carbon, carbon tax, but... Um, where there is innovation and courage, it's going to be in lots of little places spread throughout the economy, you know, and that's sort of, it's, it's kind of a guarantee against, again, the, the, you know, missing out on the low-hanging fruit that's there to be picked, right? Um, and yeah. it, it's hard to say how that might manifest itself, but, you know, if there are easy things to be done, that's going to be one way that we're going to, going to find them. Yeah, I, I think there's, I, I think no rational person would, would disagree with what you just said. I think that one has to be, in my view, has to be aware of the actual cost that is driven by a, a democratic government of putting in place such a tax. And then this is essentially the argument, I think, uh, you know, between uh, the Pagovians and the Kosians, right? Which is, Kosians' argument is, look, if you allow, if you want to compare the actual tax system we have to the one I get to create with a blank sheet of paper or where I'm emperor, uh, of course the latter tax system is going to be more uh, rational. Uh, but when you think about What's going to really happen to put in a ga- an, an incremental carbon tax? What are the compliance costs going to be? What is What are the senators from Wyoming and Montana and West Virginia going to demand in order to go along with it, et cetera? And to your point, I think it's a great test case, which is look at Lieberman and Warner. Um, look at the list of carve-outs and exceptions that were in that. And, and that was even real. I mean, people didn't really think it was going to pass. I, I think those are a bunch of lobbyists just putting in markers, saying, you know, if you ever really did this, just be aware you know, we're on, we're on the hook for we're getting this carve out. Uh, I think that a carbon tax, like any tax, over 20 or 30 or 40 years, it would become the income tax. It would be, it would be a, you know, a code book inches thick, and, you know, you'd have lobbyists uh, building expensive homes in McLean based on the profit from it, which I'm not saying is, means the carbon tax is uniquely bad. It's like any other tax. 
And so I, I think while the benefits you're describing are real, uh, I think being realistic about it, the, 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 the cost driven by real democratic politics of putting that in place really uh, clearly out of the way. I mean, I don't even think it's close. I, and mean, I, think, I, I, I understand what you're saying. I mean, I think there are lots of examples in the past where, you know, the taxes have been uh, levied and, and used to build things like the interstate highway system and things, um, you know, where it's ended up being quite productive, even though there was plenty of uh, money put in, in the pockets of a lot of men in Washington. But one thing I would say is that um, it, one, uh, one thing that, that's frustrating for me uh, is that uh, it seems to me that there is a position or there's a potential position for conservatives um, or libertarians, or people on the right, to say, look, we're going to approach carbon policy by saying that the way to do it is market-oriented. I mean, this is supposedly the, the party of business. And, and what we're going to do is we're either going to do a cap-and-trade plan and auction everything, as, uh, as Barack Obama has his, uh, you know, his official uh, platform. And that's going to be what we're going to do, is this you know, very transparent, market-oriented thing. Or we're going to do a, a carbon tax the same thing. No, you know, and we're, you know, we're just going to refund the money to the taxpayers and, 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 and not leave any laying around to be used for other things and there's going to be no exemptions. And I think that, you know, I could see a, a real, you know, shift in the Republican Party where they might be able to use that and say, and sort of reclaim their business friendliness and, you know, the reputation for sort of competent governance and, and, and you know, fiscal responsibility and all this, these things. And instead, you know, what you get is I mean, obviously, there's still, and, and you've done battle with a lot of people who deny that there's even an issue. And then, you know, you get John McCain's proposal, which is to throw a lot of money in nuclear power and things. Not that Barack isn't also giving money to different interests. But, but do you see what I'm saying? Is that, you know, why, why not try to rally the conservative movement behind passing a very clean, transparent, simple, market-oriented carbon policy instead of saying, look, there's no way we can do this. I mean. Is that just? I mean, is is it is it a problem with the Republican Party, or I mean, do you think that? I mean, it's just a problem with politics in general, or, or what? Well, let's see. I mean, for, first of all, I, I've uh, as a great comment. I mean, I've been attacked a lot more from the right than the left, uh, to be honest. Well, I, on, on things I, I've put forward. Yeah. You know, I, I, I've had Rush Limbaugh attack me, you know, at length by name a couple of times yeah. at least on his radio show. Um, who's it's not a show I listen to, but you know, fifteen million people do. Um, so which sounds a lot of fun. Um, and, and, you know, I think that uh, the following things are true. Um, part of the reason that the primary function of markets is to set prices in conditions of extreme uncertainty. And while we can, one could argue you're using the market when you create a carbon tax or a capital trade system, and I agree to an extent you are, what you're not using it to do is its primary function, which is to establish what the price is. Um, and so I think that uh, right now, uh, John McCain has, has advocated very publicly you know, a, a cap and trade system. Um, I agree with you that a rational actor would want to have a cap and, if you're going to have a cap and trade system, you ought to auction the permits rather than uh, give them away for reasons I don't need to convince you of. Um, I don't know how realistic it is that if he were, he were president, I would try to handicap the politics, that he would actually get that, have higher or lower odds of having to put in place one way or another uh, than Barack Obama, but certainly the guy running for president um, in the Republican Party is advocating a, a cap-and-trade system. But my view is that uh, there are a lot of scenarios for how it might play out politically over time. I think it's possible that if he's ever elected president, uh, there will be a big push for it. Um, when and if that happens, I think there's an opportunity for uh, Republicans in Congress to push back against it. Um, I think that they may or may not win if that happens. I think, therefore, there might be a cap-and-trade system put in place in the United States. I think if there is, it is likely either to function as it has so far in Europe, which is not really to push up the price of carbon much, uh, or if it does, it will create a big economic bite that people can run on, uh, uh, run on rolling it back. And I think that the reason why the dynamic would work that way is not uh, Republicans or whoever the right being uh, kind of pig-headed about it. Uh, I think that when you really work through the costs and benefits of it, as, as, as I've argued uh, already, and I won't try to repeat my argument, um, you know, it, it just the, the costs are substantially greater than the benefits. And I think that, that that's like gravity. That it will create a political constituency, and in my view, rationally grounded one. 
which will, uh, over time, constantly uh, push against this, because I think the facts are on the side of the argument that uh, it, it's not a good idea. It creates a benefit, but its costs are just too high. Well, I mean, I, th- I think that's possible. Uh, I mean, I'm, I think that it will, I mean, it's going to attract all the things the government attracts, but I think when you're talking about something in the neighborhood of, of 50 to $80 billion um, that's going to probably have, I mean, it's, it's not going to be a huge impact on household budgets and, and, and very well, you know, it's something that people can tell and go back and say, look, this is what we're doing to secure our energy supplies and this is what we're doing to fight global warming. I mean, I think that's I think that's something that could be potentially very politically powerful. But I think one other one other point I'd like to make, and then we can get more toward wrapping up here, is that, yep. is that in the absence of a carbon tax, where the default isn't going to be, you know, Sort of something like your, it's not just going to be something like your preferred policy choice, which is like a few billion dollars a year at, at a DARPA like organization for research. It's going to be much, much more complicated. And you're going to see a hodgepodge of carbon policies from different states and cities and countries. You're going to see a lot of things that aren't as market oriented. Um, and you're going to see people just sort of saying, you know, no more coal plants, which isn't necessarily. Um, you know, economically efficient, but absent something better, absent a pricing policy, that's that's going to be their option. They're not going to, you know, you know, there's no national framework within which they can work. So I think given, I mean, if we're looking at things from sort of a very realpolitik standpoint, you know, you need to say, here's the alternative, and it's not the optimal policy. It's a very much a suboptimal policy. Uh, I mean, do you not think that that by adopting this maybe second best solution uh, we might be uh, sort of short-circuiting a lot of a lot of other potentially worse things that would attract more, you know, government and and, uh, and be more economically efficient and more costly. Well, I think your your conclusion follows your premise. I think if one were to accept the premise that, but for having such a policy, we would have an even worse policy than any rational person before it. I think it's not so clear to me that we would want to make the assumption that voters in various jurisdictions. Uh, who, for whatever reason, are, are not passing this policy, would, would vote for politicians who want an even worse policy. I knew, but we are seeing that, right? Like, we're seeing, you know, the Northeast and California get involved in these regulations. You know, we're seeing Kansas not building coal plants. Uh, we're seeing, you know, like, one province in Canada has adopted a carbon tax, and, and you know, and other people are, you know, Europe is involved in a cap and trade. We are seeing this hodgepodge of mm-hmm. regulatory uh, solutions and litigation, and in financial markets, there's a lot of uncertainty, and so they're not willing to fund uh, some needed investments. So, I mean, we are seeing that, absent a national policy, we're getting all these different things. I mean, it's, a, it's a kind of a big mess. Yeah, I think there's definitely some of it. I think that a lot of those uh, policies, and I, I haven't gone through state by state or province by province, and there's still all in the detail. I've, I've looked at a couple of them in detail. And um, they are, the ones I've seen, and I think there are a number of these, are assertions that by the year X, we will reduce emissions by year Y. Um, and no one's, the, the costs haven't really started to bite yet. And I think that will be the test of, are, do we really, are we really faced with a hodgepodge of economically inefficient regulations, or are we faced with people making assertions about what future legislative bodies are going to do? And I, I believe that to be an open question. Well, we will see. <laughs> so... Um. It's been great talking with you, Jim. We probably yeah. should, should sit in this, but yeah, um, you too. No, this has been yeah. great. I, uh, you know, it's, it's funny because um, one of the things that I've observed in this, the generally speaking, the, the, the climate debate is, you know, the, the distinction between you know people who intend to vote for John McCain versus those who intend to vote for Barack Obama is, is a lot less relevant than the distinction between you know people who are persuadable by facts, you know, and those who aren't. Um, it's right. one of the things I've always enjoyed about our back and forth, uh, as well as those of others, which is uh, you know. We, we can agree to disagree and agree for, for a framework for getting to agreement, um, and I found it great. Well, I, I, I do appreciate the, you know, what you've added to the discussion, and it's always interesting to, to hear uh, your opinions, and uh, certainly I hope you'll come around on a carbon tax, but... <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see. see. <laughs> so. Excellent. Um, so, thanks. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Um, take care. Yeah, you too. Talk to you soon. All right, bye. Bye-bye.